Hello and welcome to episode five of the Physique Development Podcast. This show is a question and answer based show where we take questions we've been asked by our listeners and answer them through our industry experience as coaches and from our own professional perspectives. Today, we will, we will be discussing a few different topics and questions. Number one is net carbs and fiber, led by Coach Sue. Number two is protein, how much and when, led by myself, Coach Austin. And number three is a meal plan, really the worst thing ever, which I love the way that this question is posed by Coach Alex. Uh, what you can expect from today's episode and podcast is that each topic or question will be put on the clock for about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, the coach leading the topic or question will start the discussion. This will then be followed up by other coaches weighing in on their thoughts and experience. It's our goal to not only supply you, the listener, with valuable insights on the topic or question, but also just be able to plant some seeds for future research and thoughts. So without further ado, Let's get into topic number one, which is going to be net carbs and fiber. And so I'll hand it off to Sue and just pose the question. Uh, it, this is a very confusing topic as we're starting to see more and more in the media about sort of net carbs and things having more fiber and, and which type of fiber and um, should I count net carbs? Wh where should they count towards and, and all of that? So Sue, let's just open the discussion, open the floor on net carbs and fiber. Yeah. So this is definitely something I feel like is either misunderstood or just that there is so much information out there. It's kind of hard to decipher and dig through what that looks like. And I even had a conversation with a client where her fiber was extremely high. We brought it down and she was like, I always thought that fiber was good for me. So just, it didn't matter how much I ate. I just, as long as I was eating it, it was good for me. I was in a good spot, um, but she was having digestive distress and we kind of took that deeper dive into, okay, what could be causing this? And with a higher fiber count, it was something that we wanted to um, lower and see if that helped. So the reason that we want to talk about this is it's a, it's an important factor within any kind of transfer transformation or any kind of aesthetic goal and just going for your general health, your gut health in general. So it's definitely become more popular in the mainstream media, which is great. But with something becoming more popular comes a lot of quick fixes. So you'll see like skinny teas or like a, a a pill, a special pill, which we've all been waiting for that in fitness. And it's like, oh, awesome. I take this and everything's aligned and they have the commercials of like the gut just coming in line um, and the pretty bottles, whatever it may be, or just I need to stuff myself full of probiotics or prebiotics or something to make sure that I'm in the best spot. But um, it is something that you do want to make sure that your gut health is in the best spot because it'll play a big role in your ability to digest, absorb, and use utilize uh, food for performance to work towards your goals. So you've probably heard the saying you are what you eat, but it's more of you are what you digest, because if you're not properly digesting the food, then you're not able to use that for fuel, causing a lot of stomach uh, upset, um, stomach just messes, you can have extra flatulence, gas, those are the same things. But in case you didn't know, um, you can have problems with bowel movements. So it is something that I very much so hone in on with clients. And even if someone isn't tracking every single macronutrient, I'll have them track fiber because I do think it's extremely important. Um, and especially I'll talk about here in a little bit, not only net carbs, but also the different types of fiber and then how that can change things in your gut. So um, with fiber, something else that can kind of suffer if you're gut is not functioning well. Not only can you have digestive issues, you can have sugar cravings, you can have bad breath, food allergies or sensitivities, moodiness, anxiety, depression, skin problems, diabetes, or autoimmune diseases. Um, and like I said, it does come in two different forms of insoluble and soluble. So when it comes to fiber and what fiber is, fiber is a carb, carb or starch that our bodies cannot digest. So it sometimes can be a told to act like a broom to sweep out the digestive tract. Um, and dietary fiber is found in plant foods and common sources of fiber are fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. So 
when it comes to fiber, there are two types of fiber, um, soluble and insoluble. So insoluble fiber passes through the gut quickly and it can help prevent constipation. It can also help prevent infections of the gut. It can help prevent hemorrhoids, heart disease, and it can help with certain types of cancer. And then food sources include fruits with skins, uncooked vegetables, nuts, legumes, bran, brown rice, and whole grain flours. And then soluble fiber can act like a sponge in the gut. So soluble fiber and foods such as oats can bind with cholesterol and remove it from the bloodstream. And it can also help lower blood sugar because how it slows how fast food is digested. So if you have diabetes, it can be helpful in that regard. Um, and it can also help firm up stool and reduce diarrhea. So food sources include oats, oat bran, barley, dried beans, be peas, certain vegetables and fruits um, like applesauce, strawberries, potatoes, citrus, and prunes. So when it comes down to it, like I said, with insoluble fiber, that can be helpful if you have constipation, um, being able to have more insoluble fiber to help things move through the gut. And if you're having problems with diarrhea and you're like, I do not need things to move faster through my gut, being able to make sure you're leaning towards more soluble, but both have their time in place. And the reason that it is so important to make sure that you're having fiber distributed day to day in a pretty even keel. So let's say that like, for example, the client that was eating a lot of fiber, if someone's eating 60, 70 grams of fiber, I'm not going to automatically be like, all right, you're eating too much fiber. Let's bring you down to the recommended daily amount, which can be 20 to 35 grams, which is what the American Dietetic Association recommends. Um, so I'm not just going to immediately pull them to that. And same case goes if someone's eating very low fiber. So I've seen fiber and two grams, five grams, for the whole day, all the way to like in between eight to 10 grams for the whole entire day. Um, and so that's something where I'm not going to be like, okay, let's shoot you up to 20 right away. Because when it comes to fiber, as you can guess, if one type of fiber is helping move things through the stool or move your stool through your gut, um, not move things through the stool, um, or helping slow things down, if you drastically change the amount of fiber that you're eating, that can drastically change how your gut and how your colon, how your GI tract is responding to that. So I'm someone who's very sensitive to fiber. And so it's something that I always need to keep in a close eye on. Even if I am taking time away from tracking or for traveling, I do have to kind of have fiber on hand um, and make sure I hit a certain amount, no matter what that is. So even we went on our honeymoon, we didn't track or anything, but I did bring some fiber sources and I made sure that I was kind of keeping track mentally of where my fiber was so that I wasn't in a very painful spot um, on vacation where I want to be able to enjoy my myself. Um, so when it comes to fiber, like I said, that recommended daily amount is 20 to 35 grams. Um, but it is something that when it comes to the recommended amount, another metric that is used is 10 to 14 grams per 1000 calories. So the reason I mentioned per the amount of calories is because when it comes down to uh, eating the fiber, the amount of calories does change that. So if I'm in an improvement season and I'm eating a lot, my body can handle more fiber. But if I'm in a dieting phase and I try to keep that same amount of fiber, that can really screw things up for me digestion-wise of being able to keep that on track. So you can either kind of have one of those numbers and kind of shoot for it starting off, but I would always recommend to keep within five to 10 grams of fiber on a day-to-day -day basis. So not having five grams of fiber one day and then 30 grams of fiber the next day or anything like that. So being able to have a pretty close look on that. One other thing with fiber before I get into net carbs is that when it comes to fiber, you also need to think about what that fiber threshold is for you. So I personally cannot sit down and eat a, a meal that has like 20 grams of fiber in it in one sitting. I do not feel good. It feels like a rock in my stomach or I'm running to the bathroom depending on if it was leaning more towards soluble or insoluble. So that's something else to kind of keep track of if you're looking at your own food logs and you're like, well, my fiber is around the same per day, but maybe you have zero fiber all throughout the day, and then you have 30 grams in one meal, that could be causing some digestive distress. But the main thing I wanted to touch on here when it comes to fiber um, and why we want to touch on net carbs is because I feel like that's the thing that has the most confusion around it because you'll see something marketed as like, oh, only has five net carbs. And you're like, oh, sweet, five carbs. I'm going to snag that up. That's macro friendly. Uh, but the thing with net carbs, and it's gained popularity because um, 
fiber, like I talked about earlier, it's something that our bodies cannot digest. And so people think, well, if our bodies can't digest it, then I don't need to count it towards carbs. Um, But net carbs don't hold too much ground just because there is not complete truth about it not counting as calories. So humans lack the enzymes to metabolize fiber, but our gut bacteria love fiber and can metabolize it for us. So the main reason fiber has some calories in it is because your gut microbiota, when they metabolize it, release byproducts called short chain fatty acids some of which can actually be absorbed and contributed to calories because they are fatty acids. So the main reason scientists have had a hard time assigning calorie counts to fiber is because everyone's gut microbiota differs and not all um, species of bacteria metabolize the same fibers. So the type of fiber you're eating, the population of bacteria you have residing in your gut contribute a lot to like what that variance in calorie intake is going to be. And so it's very hard to put a calorie number on fiber and say, hey, it's going to be this. So it's very tricky when it comes down to it. So I always recommend for clients and anyone who asks me just to count it towards carbs because you never truly know what your gut is counting when it comes to that calorie count. So some of my personal favorite fiber sources, well, my number one is raspberries. I've ra- It's one of my favorite fruits. So I have raspberries almost every day. Um, eat, and it's great because I'll either have it with other fruit and my oats and my cream of rice. Or one of my favorite ways is just a plain rice cake with peanut butter, cinnamon, salt, and then raspberries on top. I eat it every day. Alex is shaking his head right now because I literally have it every single day. Um, unless calories get really low in prep. And then I I don't have it and I complain about it um, because it's such a good snack. It's like a little mini PB and J, but I like the crunch to it. Um, But other forms of fiber, I had mentioned them when I talked about soluble and insoluble, but some that weren't specifically mentioned in there, black beans, leafy greens, sweet potatoes, tortillas, and protein bars, and then psyllium husk. So psyllium husk is something you can get at most grocery stores. It is equal amounts of soluble and and insoluble fiber. So it's really great on that front. And it's exactly the amount of carbs that it is fiber. So it's not something that you're like, oh, well, I need to hit a fiber goal and I only have this many carbs left. If you're trying to hit a specific amount of macros, you're able to have it like tit for tat when it comes to psyllium husk. And it's something that's really easy to throw into like cream of rice, into yogurt, into a protein shake, into a green shake. One thing I will say within psyllium husk is do not let it sit in the cup. It'll expand and it'll be a really gross like consistency and even on the bottle it's like are the like tube it comes in it comes in like the cardboard things that like oats come in um it's like do not let this sit um because it is not a fun texture to drink and i found that out the hard way um but with that being able to kind of gravitate towards different things and not just looking at yes fiber is good but so is fruit so are vegetables but too much of a good thing is always going to be a bad thing or more than likely going to be a bad thing i don't want to talk in absolutes or extremes because there's not a lot of room for that when it comes to fitness in the human body. Um, But it is just something that fiber, I feel like is just misunderstood and viewed as this is good for me. So I need to eat more of it. But we do want to kind of figure out where that sweet spot is for each person. And then making sure that we're not largely varying from a day to day basis. um, And then really paying attention to how it's digesting for us. So it's something that I normally won't have it in my pre or post workout meal or a large amount because it is normally slows down digestion. Um, And so it's something that I don't want my I want my food digesting as fast as possible if I'm able to train or post training to be able to help with training and recovery. So that's basically all I have on it. Um, and you guys can take it away. Yeah. I'll just echo a lot of stuff that you said, um, or really just kind of expand a little bit, but, uh, yeah, great points. And I think when looking at like finding good fiber sources, uh, these are conversations that I have with my clients. It's just really, finding those kind of those things that you that you do enjoy eating like raspberries i know you guys are huge raspberry fans um i'm also fans of a fan of raspberries and things like strawberries and and all of that and um you know spinach and and certain leafy greens for sure um i think within a day there needs to be some non-negotiables that also kind of tick a lot of boxes and i, I like to kind of kind of create these things. And I think this sort of builds upon what Alice is going to talk about later, which is uh, sort of a, a, why meal plans may not be the worst thing in the world. Um, because you, you're able to sort of create these non-negotiables. And 
within these non-negotiables, I, I think ticking boxes with great fiber sources that you enjoy to eat, that work well for you, that come in the right quantities, um, you know, not too low or not too high, which we all know comes with a, its own problem and territory of issues, um, is something that is very advantageous uh, for everyone. So the other thing with net car, like net carbs as a whole, um, keep it easy. Uh, and that's, that's always been my, my take on it. Um, really early on when I really started to track macros and I was going through early preps and stuff, I just completely lost on what net carbs even would mean. And I kept reading what it was and I was like, this still doesn't make sense. And and how is this? So, and then you run into issues with certain companies who advertise this certain type of fiber and this certain type of net carb. And then, oh, it turns out years later, that's come out and that's no longer the case. And, oh, sorry, we were wrong. And there's some gray areas here that I, I think keeping it simple, um, kind of using that kiss method of, of keep it simple, stupid, um, is, is a really good, not that none of this matters, but is a really good way of just sort of approaching nutrition. And, um, especially if you're looking to track calories and, and stay consistent over time and with something like net carbs, like I just, I've always counted them as carbohydrates. I've always counted all, if I go, if it goes in, it's counted and, that's that. And, and as long as you're doing that consistently over time and making adjustments based off of that consistency, whether it be right or wrong, I think that's a good way to go about it. But that's all of the points I had. So Alex is, uh, Alex is up. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> the few things that I will add to this is that, um, with, with net carbs, it is a, a marketing tactic first and foremost with, with many of these companies uh, to appeal to you all that it is less calories more so than anything. Um, so I think that keeping it as simple as possible and just whatever goes in your mouth, tracking it um, being the, the main thing. And then the other portion that I want to bring up is that there's growing literature that the, the healthier that your gut is, the healthier that your digestive system is, the better your mood is going to be, the better your energy production is going to be. Um, it facilitates or plays a role in many aspects of your internal affairs, of course. Uh, so it's, it's important to get your fiber in and, and make sure that your digestive health is optimized as much as possible. All right, let's, let's dig in to topic number two. Uh, Austin, how much protein should I consume and when should I consume that protein? So with protein, uh, protein has been a heavily Oddly enough, to beta topic, you know, there's there's teams for everything, and so, you know, there's team high protein, there's team uh, low protein, there's there's team every everything protein, and you know, there's there's definitely leaders within our our industry and within our space who are sort of half polarizing views, and it seems within the, the within the literature that they're all sort of covered within the basis of of what makes sense. So. Um, there's a low protein sort of threshold of sort of a basement of let's at least get this. This seems to be good. And then there, you can go all the way up to like what we, what we would see as sort of a high protein amount that also seems to be good and doesn't come with too many negative or any negative consequences that we're currently aware of. So I just want to kind of introduce the topic in that way of there, there's so many sides of this equation and there are a lot of you know, nuanced topics, if you will, within this. But I think as a whole, it's really important to just today, I just really want to dive into sort of this, the basics of protein. What is, what is protein? What does it do for us? Um, what's a good range of intake if you're just looking to be healthy and put on some muscle um, and to be within the range of what is found in the literature for healthy exercising adults? Uh, that's where we're going to stay today. And then getting into some things that, um, and then I'm going to actually go over some stuff for, for vegan and vegetarian uh, diets and, and clients, and then uh, getting into uh, just a few notes that uh, I personally have from clients, and I'll open up the floor to these guys and have them sort of speak on their experience with uh, what they've seen with their clients. So in terms of getting in protein and, and sort of individualizing protein intakes, uh, it's the clients. So Protein at four calories per gram. This is similar to carbohydrates in terms of the calories that they pack per gram. Uh, dietary protein is essential to life and maintenance of our health, especially when considering its importance in building and maintaining muscle, which is probably the most important here. Uh, 
the growth and repair of tissues and cells, also very important, and structural roles within connective tissue, bones, and organs, all very, very important. So we don't just use protein for our muscles. We use proteins for nearly everything, and they also help assist other things, um, especially within their amino acid profiles. So protein is very important. So protein, unlike carbohydrates and fats, doesn't have uh, a stored reserve to use when availability is low. Okay, so we have fat stores uh, within our fat cells that we can mobilize and use when we're sort of not taking in enough or running out of energy that way. And then we have carbohydrate stores in the form of glycogen that live within our muscle and liver um, mainly, and they can be mobilized when we need the fuel. But protein, we don't really have any reserves. The only reserves we actually have is our muscles themselves, which we don't really want to use for energy if we can avoid it. So we don't have those, uh, reserves when availability is low. Um, this is why sort of, this is why it's so important to consume adequate amounts of protein per day and reduce that chance of skeletal muscle breakdown from occurring. All right. So amino acids are the building blocks of protein. I'm sure you've heard that a lot. So there's over 300 amino acids that have been identified in nature, um, more of a fun fact than anything, but only 20 of them have been found to be used sort of in human bodily functions. Those are then broken up into what we know as essential and non-essential amino acids, right? So EAAs and NEAAs, which EAAs are going to be ones you're more familiar with. And EAAs are basically the essential amino acids basically just means these are not produced by the human body. Therefore, we have to consume them and provide these amino acids via our diets. Okay, so these non-essential amino acids, we don't necessarily have to consume as they can be synthesized and sort of produced uh, through other protein sources by our bodies. Okay, so that's kind of a in little introduction to protein. So how much per day is what we're going to get into here. And the current RDA, um, so that's recommended dietary allowance for protein is currently 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram per day. Okay. So that's, if you did the math on that, that's going to be fairly low, um, and arguably low, especially for anyone who is an active up and moving, especially strength training involved adult. Okay. So 0 0.8 grams does cover a wide range of the population. So we don't need to go punching anyone in a debate here for recommending that, but it's one of those things where if you're an exercising active adults who's involved in strength training or any resistance based training, um, or heavy aerobic, uh, with high impact based training upwards of, uh, 1.6 to 2.2 grams per of protein per kilogram per day is going to be that range, it's sort of our sweet spot. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how you can sort of start to go above that potentially based on kind of your individual needs. Okay. So again, that number of 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram per day has been disputed, um, in meeting the needs of exercising adults. Okay. So within the range that we're going to be talking about today, that sweet spot. I just want to kind of, uh, say this one more time and repeat myself here. 1.6 to 2.2 grams of protein per kilogram per day. Okay. So you guys, I trust you guys can go and do the kilogram, uh, conversion from pounds. If you've never done it, it's good to use the metric system once in a while, since that's what the rest of the world uses, we can conform this once I promise. So if you don't know what you are in kilograms, um, for example, I'm about, uh, 210, 212 pounds, and I live around 95 kilograms. Um, so gen in general, just to kind of give you rough numbers here, if you were a hundred kilogram individual, so if I wouldn't have lost some weight here from COVID, um, well, that was good weight loss that I lost from like some accumulation via COVID. Um, if I was a hundred kilograms still, uh, that recommended protein per day intake would for me would be a low end of around 160 and an upper range of around 220 uh, to 230 grams of protein per day, which depending on who you are and kind of 
what camp you've lived in or who you've read or who you follow, that could seem either really high or potentially just very moderate. Um, but there are um, some studies, a, a recent one by, uh, if I'm not mistaken, by Helms and, and colleagues that has tested the waters of upwards of three um, grams of, of protein per kilogram per day without any adverse effects shown. And depending on the individual, and I'm sure we'll get this sort of deep into the weeds on on where this may come up in future podcast episodes, but just understand that you can go above that 2.2. Um, some ranges even in the literature go up to 2.4, but I just wanted to kind of average out uh, sort of the general consensus for that 1.6 to 2.2. Okay, so there is evidence to suggest that the influence of resistance training can be augmented by the supporting nutritional strategies, which does come into play with that daily protein intake, right? So that at least that 1.6 grams per kilogram per day mm -hmm. and protein distribution, which is going to really come into play um, as that second most important thing, right? So if we're looking at sort of a, a hierarchy of importance, which I'll go over a little bit later, we're going to be looking at protein, total protein intake in the day, then the second probably most important in terms of hierarchy of needs is going to be overall protein quality and distribution throughout the day, okay? In terms of hierarchy of importance. Next, I kind of want to get into, um, I want to get into some protein stuff for vegan and vegetarian diets or dieters or just folks in general. So the quality of protein ingested, um, this is going to kind of get into protein quality, which it runs true for both uh, vegans, vegetarians, and, and sort of animal-based uh, people, non-vegan, non-vegetarian dieters. Um, but the quality of protein ingested in any diet is, is extremely important, basically for the, the accretion, the growth, um, the addition of, of skeletal muscle, muscle in particular. Uh, so the quality of protein source is a function of its composition, basically of those essential amino acids, right? So earlier we talked about those EAAs, okay, in both quality and proportion. Okay, so a complete protein, I'm sure you've heard this or read this, um, especially if you are a vegan or vegetarian dieter, but this is a very important point, so do pay attention. A complete protein contains all nine essential amino acids and the amounts needed to support lean muscle tissue maintenance and growth. Okay, so an incomplete protein represents proteins low in essential amino acids, right? So we're looking to kind of create that complete protein by sort of addition of multiple or two incomplete proteins can often come together to create a complete protein, which is typically where you see the most popular vegan, vegetarian sort of dishes and, and good protein sources, okay? So just a few more things on plant-based uh, plant diets here. Plant-based proteins often lack sufficient amino or essential amino acids. So again, by definition, uh, incomplete proteins. And all this basically means, again, is you need to be more aware of the quality and how to best pair those two incomplete proteins to create one complete protein, right? And you could, this is a quick Google. If you guys want to go to Google and just uh, sort of type in uh, complete protein sources for plant-based diets, there's a plethora of choices. There's a, there's a laundry list of, of things that you can choose from. Uh, and that's that's a great way uh, to start, start learning about these things. Um, and I know uh, Legion has uh, some really good articles on this, uh, especially for uh, individuals looking to build muscle and, and so forth. So uh, you can check out one of their blogs um, to, to learn a bit more on that. So... Um, now, the last thing I want, I want to mention here again is, is just kind of that importance of leucine per meal. And that's again, going to get into, this is where really high quality, um, protein sources are, are going to be really important, right? So when we're looking at really high quality protein sources and animal proteins, these are easier to come by these really good, high quality lean protein sources like, uh, chicken, fish, uh, beef, things like that. Um, in terms of the plant-based uh, diet, they are available to you, um, but they are going to be harder to come by. So you have to be intentional about seeking them out. And again, there's some great articles out there and you can also just 
start to use the Google machine here uh, and find some really good ones for you. All right, so last notes here. Um, again, it's just notes for some clients or from clients here. Uh, and just kind of to recap what I went over. Number one, it's good to ind individualize protein intake to the client, which is basically going to come down to lifestyle, their preference, their ability, um, or their capabilities, and within their needs, right? So we, we can get in a little bit more on that in terms of the discussion portion of this, this topic. Number two, too high of protein can cause uh, some gastrointestinal discomfort for some. Uh, so you need to adjust that if, if need be, right? So that's going to come down also to kind of their gut health environment, where that's currently at, how many other variables are either in or out of place and, um, sort of repairing some things and, and getting some things in check could help that overall. But all in all, in, if it's something that disrupts your, your gastrointestinal, um, performance, you can bring that number down. And again, that's why there's kind of that lower end and top end, and you can start to individualize that to you and, and just go off what's best for you, right? Number three, uh, protein shakes. Uh, this is a hot topic uh, or just something that's commonly asked. So protein shakes are a great way to get in your protein goals each day uh, as needed. And I personally consume probably one to two shakes per day, depending on how high my current protein goals are, how fast paced my day is going, or just what are my available uh, sources? Um, and do I have any good sources cooked or do I have time to cook them? Uh, and so I usually get in one shake, at least post-workout, and typically another one uh, later in the evening if I just, I need to get it in either before bed or I just, I was short on my goal. Um, and so that's typically a great way uh, to, to do that in, within a protein shake. So the next point here, protein bolus every four to five hours is probably a good idea to increase times of muscle protein synthesis versus breakdown throughout the day. Okay, well, we can get into some of that um, here in a little, in a little bit um, or in future episodes for sure. Uh, and in general, in the grand scheme of things, uh, focus on trying to hit daily protein goal. Again, looking at this high uh, hierarchy of importance, um, try to hit that daily protein goal first and foremost. Next, followed by just trying to fill that goal with good quality protein sources, whether those be animal-based or vegan or just plant-based all around. Um, and then at the end of the day, looking at overall distribution of protein. So looking at meal timing, trying to spread those meals out um, within, you know, at least four meals per day has kind of been found to be a good consensus of depending on when you're waking up, starting to eat um, and so on. But at least four protein boluses throughout the day is, is, is a good place to start. So that's a little bit about protein. Awesome. Um, I think I have a very fun analogy that I use with many clients to speak on muscle protein synthesis. Um, and, and, and I'll, I'll be quick with it. So when we look at muscle protein synthesis and, and a common question or things that maybe your, your coach in the past or someone that you look up to has recommended is to drink essential amino acids or BCAAs throughout the day. And, and I'm going to use this analogy to give you a reasoning why that's not a good idea. So you are in a vehicle and you are driving along the road and you want to go to space really bad. And so we're going to view muscle protein synthesis as space. And, and where we have that threshold that we have to get to when Austin was talking about the leucine threshold and getting that quality protein in, we have this, uh, you know, line here that we're going to consider space and we're driving along. Well, when we consume the, the chicken or we consume the beef or what have you, we are consuming the leucine threshold. We're consuming the isoleucine. We're consuming the valine. We're picking our friends up and we are now turning our car into a spaceship. And now we are jetting up to space and it is a muscle building party up there. And so you get to spend a little bit of time partying it up, building some muscle, but your buddies have to stay. They, they, they can't come with you. You've got to go back down to earth and you can't just keep staying up there. You've got to come back down to refuel the car. Thus, you've got to come back down. And then once you get back down at that point, you'll be able to become a spaceship again. And you have to go up through these peaks and valleys, essentially, to achieve muscle protein synthesis adequately to allow for muscle uh, building to occur rather than being in a, uh, a state of just constantly trying to feed, 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 like we're not going to be able to stay anabolic all the time. Like we have to have times of anabolism and then we have to have times where we're back at the baseline and getting back to that point. So 
protein consumption and timing of that is very important in terms of optimization of the, the protein itself. Yeah. Um, so I'll go ahead and talk on a few things here for vegans. Um, one thing I'll say is that vegans don't necessarily need less, but oftentimes I will change their macro distribution to have lower protein because of protein sourcing. So when it comes to protein sourcing for vegans, there are very few, if any options that are just protein. When it comes to being a non-vegan, if I have chicken, lean chicken, I'm pretty dang close to it being only protein, maybe one gram of fat per a whole serving of chicken. So it's pretty easy for me just to hit my protein intake. But when it comes to vegan protein sourcing, oftentimes it does have fat and carb content alongside with it. And so if it's in a place where I'd rather have someone be at a little bit lower intake of protein, but it's still within that range that Austin talked about, but being able to be something that's maintainable and sustainable to their lifestyle. So if it's in the spot where they hate their foods, they hate what they're eating because they have to cram in all these things to hit a protein goal, that's not going to be sustainable. And then that's also playing into their mental health of not enjoying what they're doing. They're just straight up not having a good time. Um, And then it puts them in a place where that muscle building might even be um, kind of undercut of this place of their mentality. So that's just one note I like to make. It's not that vegans necessarily need less protein. It's just kind of weighing the pros and cons of what the benefit is of having them at that higher intake. And then on that same note, talking about maintainability and sustainability, it's something that I'll play around with clients' protein intake, where most of the time, if you're in a deficit or you're in a surplus, Plus, your protein basically stays around the same bit. Um, Now, mine has changed in the past, whether I'm in a deficit of maybe having a little bit higher protein for some more satiation. And like Austin talked about, there's not a storage mechanism in the body for holding on to that protein. So it's something that I'm not like adding excess fat per se to my body. And so um, that's not to say that if you were to just eat protein, that you could eat as much protein as you'd want and you'd still not gain weight. Obviously, the uh, the concept of calories in versus calories out still hold. But when we're talking about those macronutrients, it's also something of being able to see what's sustainable for someone's life. So for example, my dad is around 200 or so pounds. It is not sustainable or any bit enjoyable for him to eat 200 grams of protein per day, but he doesn't need to. He needs a basic threshold to make sure that he's keeping up his like skeleton and his muscles to be able to age in a proper way. Um, so it's in a place that when I did macros for him, I put it at a much lower amount. I put it around like 140, 130, 150, because that was something that was going to be a lot more maintainable for him. And like Alex talked about within muscle protein synthesis and being able to spike it, I'm going to talk on something as far as optimizing results. Now with this optimization, I will also say at the end that if you're a brand new beginner, please do not feel like you have have to go to this, we do want to keep it simple, stupid. So um, let's say someone's protein goal is 140 grams of protein. It doesn't really matter um, how we get our protein in as long as we get it in. And I, it does matter. So if your goal is 140 grams, let's say person A eats a serving of 10 grams, a serving of 20 grams, 70 grams, 15 grams, 25 grams. You don't have to memorize all those. They add up to 140. I double checked the math. Um, but just know that there's a skewed distribution. And then let's say person B eats 35 grams four times a day, just even keel across the board. Now, person A and person B have both hit their goal of 140 grams of protein, go person A and person B. Um, But how they went about it is vastly different. So person B actually had that better anabolic response like Alex was talking about. And this might seem nitpicky, but it's something that we get asked all the time. How can I optimize my results? And this is one thing that you can dig into without changing or doing something crazy of just optimizing how you distribute your protein. So another side note I want to make here is 20 to 25 grams of protein is noted as the minimum amount amount to maximally stimulate that muscle protein synthesis. So this means if you're to consume less than that 20 grams of protein in a meal, the muscle protein synthesis or muscle protein response is going to be submaximal. And when it comes to MPS, we want to spike it throughout the day, like Alex said. Um, and that's why we don't just have feedings of five grams of protein every 15 minutes. It's also why we don't personally recommend having BCAAs in your gallon jug and drinking it throughout the whole entire day or EAAs where you might be like, well, these are essential. So I'm having them. But like Alex said, you got to come back down to earth. You can't stay in your muscle building party for forever. Um, So it's something that you don't want to 
be like bumping it up slowly throughout the day and not at that level where you're spiking and going back down. You want those peaks and valleys when it comes to muscle protein synthesis. So BCAAs or EAAs are not inherently bad. Do not twist my words on that, but it's just something that I would not personally recommend drinking them in your gallon jug all throughout the day. Um, And then like Austin said, making sure you have complete protein sources. Um, And if you're having troubles hitting your protein, make sure just divide it by three to five and get your protein level for each meal. And this will help how you're not looking at your protein goal as this big, scary number of, oh my gosh, I have to hit 100 grams a day or I have to 150 or I have to hit 200 grams a day. It's broken down into how many meals you eat. And then it's like, all right, just within this one meal, I need to hit 35 grams. And that's a much easier way. And it's much easier than playing catch up at the end of the day when you've just kind of put protein in sprinkled throughout the day. And then you're like, man, I got 70 grams to eat in this one meal. And I do not want to just eat 70 grams of egg whites or chicken or whatever it may be. Um, So the last note I'll make on that with when it comes to protein, a great way to mix it up is be able to have multiple sources per meal. So eggs are a thing that Alex and I get very tired of very quickly. And especially with the protein goals that Alex and I have to hit, it's something that that's a lot of eggs on a plate. And I'm sorry, just eggs are one of the things that just get gross to me after a while. And so it's something that Alex was having bagel and eggs. And he was like, Oh my gosh, I cannot have eggs one more time. I can't do it. And so I made a breakfast scramble for him. So it's not like you're just eating like seven ounces of chicken or 20 eggs in one sitting. So in that breakfast scramble, it had sweet potatoes, it had spinach, it had eggs, it had turkey or beef or chicken, just pick one. Um, It also had a center cut bacon, some avocado and... um, there's something else in it that I'm blanking on, but oh, black beans. Um, so <laughs> it, it was able to hit multiple sources, multiple sourcings of protein. So it didn't just feel like I'm sitting here eating eggs. And so if you ever feel like, oh my gosh, this is so much protein in one sitting, I would highly, highly recommend switching how you eat your protein and not feeling like I just have to eat chicken in this one, have chicken, have black beans, have some cheese, have something in that to add to it. So it doesn't feel like you're just like, Meh, I hate everything. I wanted to add a, a couple things here just to, to echo again, what you both were kind of talking about, um, just to solidify a few things. Um, so number one here, if you are confused or you're very new, um, or you, protein goals stress you out, consider just if you one, if, if you just don't even know what to do or what to eat or, or what your protein goal would be, around four to five meals a day, around 20 to 40 grams of protein per meal, if you can do it, great place to start. Okay, so, and then also, if you're in a situation ever, and I do this quite a bit, especially if I'm eating meals with family um, and they don't care about my muscle gains or anything like that, <laughs> um, typically my mom does because she's usually the person who tells me I'm getting smaller. Um <laughs> is basically if you're at like a family event or something or you know that meal isn't going to have a a sufficient amount of protein just bring a couple scoops of protein with you have a shake during the meal or right before the meal or right after the meal and just no you don't have to like make it a thing like oh my god you guys have to all cook more protein for me um just eat the meal like a normal person would just bring a shake with you have it with the meal and that works the same as like creating that more mixed meal of multiple protein sources in one meal, right? So it all kind of works the same. Make it easy on yourself. Um, don't make it more complicated uh, than it needs to be. And, and really with this subject and hitting protein goals, ticking those general low-end boxes of importance really, really, really goes a long way. Um, and there are you know a few points we can make that may be like really advanced, um, but as a whole, I'd say if you tick all those boxes we talked about today, getting in your adequate protein um, within that 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram per day, uh, if you want to calculate that that out for yourself, um, is a great goal to sort of range to be in. Um, If you don't want to do that, just try to monitor having each time you get to eat, try to have 20 to 40 grams uh, of protein per meal. And when in doubt, protein shakes always a great option yeah awesome so on that same note talking about protein distribution food fiber all those things alex is a meal plan really the worst thing ever 
It is not. It is not the worst thing ever. Shock and awe. Wow. Uh It it is earth shattering (laughs) uh, information. But I I think that many people run into this where it has been um, shown on social media and things of that nature where a meal plan will be posted on someone's story and being like, this coach is a dickhead. He's, you know, prescribing this ridiculous uh, meal plan or, or what have you, and it's 700 calories or whatever. It's it's something ridiculous. And I think that people immediately attach this this horrible low calorie approach to meal plans and and just, you know, say that that's what that is. And, and in reality, meal plans can be very beneficial for specific scenarios. And, and at Physique Development, we are going to advocate flexible dieting through and through. I mean, 99 something percent of all of our clients are tracking macros to to a certain degree. And so that's going to be the first and foremost, but meal plans can work in conjunction with flexible dieting. Oh my gosh, this is, I mean, again, <laughs> earth shattering information that we are sharing here. Um, and why they why they can be helpful and and well let me let me backtrack and and say that we don't create meal plans as as a staff more so and and, and for a few reasons my taste buds are not the same as your taste buds if you're a client of ours sue's taste buds are different things that sue enjoys i don't enjoy i promise you some of the food she eats is not good thus if she was to make me a meal plan well she knows my taste buds but more so if she was to make a meal plan for me and just go off of hers i'd be like like, eh, I could probably not eat meal two and definitely not meal three. <laughs> wow. But I mean, the clock, and so wow. that's the that's what kind of you run into. And so we work more cohesively with the, our clients and provide the macronutrient protocols, the fiber intake. And then from there, have them construct, OK, what are some meals that you would see yourself having and how frequently can you eat? What's the kind of the best scheme for you throughout your day, whether it be a work day or a, a day you have off of work or what have you and, and constructing that there, sharing that and then going back and forth to fit what is best, whether that be maybe they're lacking micronutrients, maybe they're lacking fiber and making a meal plan just to have a rough base of, of home, right? Because it's very easy, especially when you're tracking macros and things like that to get caught up and very frustrated in the moment you're hungry and you're like, damn it, this doesn't fit into the macros that I have left and and become very frustrated rather than looking at things from a meal plan perspective and just having some base meals that you can pull from. So um, let's get into uh, some examples of why why or when you would use a, a meal plan. If you're new to tracking macros, I think that a meal plan can be a great learning tool as well as a base like I spoke on. So if you're new to tracking macros, completely new, and you haven't used my fitness pal or anything like that, this will be a great teaching opportunity for you to learn about the app and just playing with scanning in different things and seeing what fits. Because the the world of flexible dieting is very daunting when you first start. When you first start tracking, it's like, I can eat whatever I want. I, I don't know where to start. I, I, I love all this food. Let's just keep eating. And then it's like, oh, whoa, I'm a little over on fat. I'm definitely over on carbs. I don't have near enough protein. How am I going to get to this protein goal that my coach has put into place? So a meal plan is fantastic for you to start with just to have a base. And guess what? You can start having the meal plan. You maybe have meal one, meal two. You're, you get called away for work on meal three. And you're like, well, I don't have that meal. You just subtract it out of my fitness pal. And all of a sudden you have the availability to either get a, have a protein shake, have you know, Chipotle or something that's a little bit easier on the go to track and, and kind of filling in the blanks there. Example number two would be catering to a very busy schedule. We are all very, very busy. We all have a lot on our plate, chasing around kids, chasing around um, business partners, things of that nature. And the, this gives you the opportunity to take things off of your plate. We all experience decision fatigue throughout the day, whether that be mm-hmm. picking out your outfit, picking out the clothes that are, that was the same thing, picking <laughs> out the foods that you're going to eat each day. These are simple things that you can plan ahead of time to allow for that decision fatigue to rest on things that really need the decisions. Because in reality, the the thing is, is that The foods that we eat don't have to be that extravagant or anything of that nature. They simply need to, at at the end of the day, fuel and and nourish your body. Uh, So that's a a big component there and can be extremely helpful when you are in a very, very busy schedule. The third example that I will give is that you've been all over the place recently. 
where um, you, your meals are maybe you're having a meal at 8 a.m. and then you're not getting to eat again until 4 p.m. in the uh, afternoon. And then you have this massive meal at 9 p.m. because you're just far behind. And so you're kind of finding yourself very busy, which would go along with example two, but you're, you're finding yourself just all over the place and, and no structure to your meals. It just gets you back to the home base, re, uh, re-centers yourself and allows for you to get back into routine, get back into tracking more consistently potentially and allow for some momentum to be built. Um, so that would be the three big examples that, um, I would give and, and some, just some simple add-ons to this is that the meal plans, if you're creating them can be different all seven days. If you want, if you want to create a different meal plan for every single day, depending on, um, you know, what's going on with your day and things of that nature, you can do that. Of course, it's going to be a little tedious and things of that nature, but it still can give you some more structure and be helpful for you. Um, Yeah, I think that uh, making sure also the last thing that I'll touch on uh, is make sure that you're not just focused on macros when you're when you're looking at just the macronutrients, you're missing um, the is it the forest for the trees? What's that saying? Yeah, you're missing the forest through the trees. Yeah, bingo that. And so we want to still make a point of fruits and vegetables, micros, fiber, those different portions of that are still going to be a very valuable piece within these meal plans. It's very easy to get caught up in just thinking what's being shown more so on that, that main page of my fitness pal with the macros, but you have to make a a big point of that as well. Yeah. I mean, all great, great points here. And I'm not anti meal plan. I'm anti bad coach meal plans. Um, And I think that's an important distinction to make. Like Alex said, they get a bad rap because a lot of coaches have abused it. But on the same vein, flexible dieting has gotten a really bad rap. So it's kind of choosing what's going to work best for you and what's going to be best for your health. One other example I'll give on top of Alex's three examples for a meal plan. Another benefit is if you are having like health issues. So I've had friends and clients been in some health issues that like there needs to be like complete control of food in regards to a meal plan, whether that's from a dietitian or a doctor, whatever it may be. So that's just one other thing I wanted to note there. Um, But if meal plans kind of freak you out, because then you're like, oh, no, I don't have flexibility. Um, You don't have to like Alex said, it doesn't it can be different each day. And what I commonly recommend is being able to have an outline of meals that you kind of stick to of a skeleton. So for example, Alex and I probably have like 15 rotating meals. And when we get tired of one, we rotate it out and put in another. Um, But we have the same base 15 meals that we kind of go through. And so that goes along with my base grocery shopping, which if you go to the physique development YouTube, there is a video of me talking through how we meal prep and how we grocery shop. Um, Because it's something that having that base grocery list and having that base amount of meal prep, where I don't put everything in containers and have it ready to go for each meal, I more so prep things in bulk. So when it comes to the meal, I can have flexibility in saying, no, I wanted rice instead of sweet potatoes. And that's what flexibility was originally made for, to have flexibility to fit our cravings for it to be sustainable and maintainable. The problem I have with meal plans is when it comes to it, oftentimes people who are on meal plans are just good at following directions and they're not great at understanding food. Meal plans give you that ability, like Alex said, to build momentum, to follow directions, to get back on track, which is phenomenal. But at the same time, if you don't don't understand food, it can put you in a bind where if you are going out to eat, you don't know how to switch that meal out. You don't know how to track that. So another way to break it down, if you are not like, if you're not crazy about the idea of a meal plan is having a meal plan by macros. So dividing your macros evenly, um, like by the amount of meals you're going to have and say for each meal, I'm going to hit these macros. And that can be like your outline of a meal plan, so to speak, Um, or being able just to keep it simple. Uh, Many times when people are like that, decision fatigue is so, so real when you first get into macros. And Alex, Austin, and I all abused it big time. We even got into the point of like, I know watching their old full day of eating. Dude, I'd hoard, 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 just have a, oh my God, don't watch them. Yeah. Yeah. Don't watch them. They're off. It's watch them for what not to do. Um, and even I have a video on like my YouTube channel that I haven't personally uploaded in and I don't know how long, but like when I first learned about macros, I was eating like cookie crisp, uh, like ice cream and like cookies, like for my main food sources, because I was just like, Oh my gosh, 
I can hit, I can eat this and still hit my goals. Um, but like Alex said, do you want to focus on the micronutrients? That's the thing that gets mix, mixed up with flexible dieting is you don't want to be so flexible that you're having low quality food, low quality protein sources, not focusing on fiber. And you don't want to be so rigid that you can't go out to eat with a friend because you have to follow your meal plan or that's you falling off track. It's being able to find that happy medium of I want sweet potatoes today instead of rice. I'm going to make that swap or I want barbecue instead of ketchup as my theme for the meal today, I'm going to make that swap. So really being able to keep it simple. And if you are like still again, meal plan ain't for me, then track your meals the night before so you can make that sample meal plan, so to speak, for your day. So you're not sitting there trying to make things fit throughout the whole day. Um, So those would be kind of my things as far as how you can transition from a meal plan to flexible dieting or how you can use them both at the same time without feeling like you have to commit to one. And with that, you don't have to commit to one. You don't have to be like, I'm doing a meal plan. That means I have to do a meal plan for the rest of my life, or I am a liar, or I'm doing flexible dieting and I can never go to a meal plan because meal plans are bad for you. No, do what you want. Don't put a label on it and do what best suits you and your life. And don't look at things as so black and white. I corrected myself earlier of not making an absolute comment because when it comes to the human body and when it comes to your fitness goals, there's not a lot of absolutes. Um, so being able to not look just, oh, it's black and white and I have to do a meal plan or flexible dieting or it's meal plan versus flexible dieting. They can both coexist and we can all be okay. Work as a cohesive unit. And again, um, we all spend too much time together and, and talk about these subjects too often, um, <laughs> so, and, which is a good thing, right? It, it's a great thing. And I, I'm really glad we can do that uh, just on a recorded platform now. But I'm just going to echo you know, all, all the things that you guys said, because um, I think you covered it really well. Uh, the one thing, uh, you know, kind of not seeing the forest through the trees is, is a similar way of um, similar, but different. Uh, a way to say that, kind of say that is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, just because meal plans are identified with these crazy low calorie restricted diets that people that we typically would see as maybe a charlatan or some sort of zealot, or they've been labeled as that are putting out for whether that's money or lack of knowledge or ill intent or whatever. Um, whatever it may be, right? Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't, if, if meal plans had a personality, I would say they're, they're a pretty moderately happy person going through life that they just want to be appreciated like the rest of us. Right. So let's not completely shit on that individual for just being included in a group that they didn't actually want to be in, in the first place. Um, for those of you who followed that analogy, um, thank you. Uh, but (laughs) Essentially, yeah, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And and just because those things are happening, um, you know, in front of our eyes or are being identified together, it doesn't make them necessarily bad. Um, and I, I think it's important for guy, people like us, coaches like us to, to have conversations like this because it can open the door um, just to, to having these conversations because I know as silly as that sounds, um, it's one of those things that you, you don't want to be looked down upon because you've mentioned something right. Um, as an alternative method or alternative theory, because it's been grouped in with this other thing. That's like, no, 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 we can't talk about that. That's unscientific or unfounded. Um, but psychologically from a meal plan perspective of, of creating accountability, creating momentum, creating structure, not necessarily rigidity, but structure, um, within someone's day is a great is a great thing. And that leads me to my next point, which is to echo um, what Alex said, basically creating momentum in a safe environment uh, is the first thing that I, I think about meal plans. It's the same general thing is it's a training program for your nutrition. I mean, it's your sets and reps. It's it's your rest periods of time in between meals. It's it's your training program for your nutrition. And it's at least the way I look at it. So creating momentum in a safe environment, which allows you to do so while you learn um, what these sort of inner workings or mechanics are doing. Um, so I, I think to echo Sue here, one of the the struggles that meal plans can bring is sort of this this crutch, right? It, it's this It's this crutch that gives us something that can give us a result, but at the end of the day, 
I wasn't really paying attention and I don't quite understand how you got there, right? It's it's the it's the teacher working out the the math problem for you and when it comes to the test you're lost. You know, you get A's on your homework but you flunk the exam because you didn't actually do the work. You don't actually understand the arithmetic if you would of how to track or what that tracking means or now that I'm out at a restaurant and you know, let's say something as easy as Chipotle, right? One of the most e- easy meals to track of going out to eat and having a meal. You, if you don't understand, or, or let's say you're at a different restaurant, right? Substituting like keeping oils and, and nonsense out of like what they used to cook the food out of the equation, right? Because we have to sort of keep that in mind to some extent here. But the general structure of, of this range true. You have a you have a meal you're going to order you, on the menu. You're kind of at a local joint, but it kind of looks like exactly what you would have at home or exactly kind of the same structure of what you'd have at something like Chipotle. And you can generally sort of identify what those macros would be, right? You can get an idea of like looking at it. Okay. When I get this meal, this is, you can start to eyeball things, right? This is generally around this amount of protein I'd have in this meal, like the amount of chicken I'd have here. This looks like around a cup of rice, though, which means this is around X amount of carbs, right? You just, you start to learn and and to kind of circle back to my point before I go too often to the deep end here, just create momentum within a safe environment, right? And I I think that's what meal plans are. Again, the training program for your nutrition and it's sort of a a way to hold your hand and sort of point cool things out as you go through the, the experience of, Hey, this is, this is this meal. This is. While you don't have to go through the decision fatigue to come up with it, this is this meal that you not normally would eat, but this is also the macros that come with it, right? And this is kind of what this, you know, these portion sizes look like, right? And this is a good meal in this situation too, if you have the similar macros and, and so on and so forth. Um, one of my favorite things outside of a, a structured meal plan of telling you exactly what to eat uh, is the macros by meal method. Um, it, it's, it's sort of the next step, I think. Um, and it's something that can help so much accountability. It helps myself and I know helps, uh, you know, you guys and it helps a lot of my clients. Um, it's just understanding that you can, you know, I, I work off meal plans. If I'm in a, if I have a physique goal and I'm super busy, I'm going to write down a meal plan A and a meal plan B, and I'm going to have those out and I'm just going to follow those to a T every single day, whether it's a, pl- a meal plan A or B, depending on how my day goes. Um, and also you can. Meal plan A could be for the way if I was going to train in the morning and meal plan B would be if I was like training in the evening. And depending on when I get to train that day, that's the one I choose. No questions asked. I know exactly I'm going to hit my macros. It's it's fine. Like I'm going to get to my goal no matter what's going on in my day. And that's where that can come in. And if I'm a little less busy or my goal isn't quite as extreme um, or time sensitive, maybe I go macros by meal or that's just generally a good way to be sure I hit my macros by the end of the day. That way I'm not left with that 70 grams of protein at night. Um, wishing you didn't do it as you try to lay down and go to sleep and you're just cursing yourself for doing that. Um, and then as far as the why is behind, you know, I, I was on a call with some yesterday and we had the meal plan conversation and one of the things that are, is really tough on behalf of a coach um, as far as meal plans go is those preferences, right? And as we do coach clients around the globe, you when you start going across cultures, you get into cultural norms, you get into cultural cuisines that do change and evolve. I have no idea what's either in stock or out of stock of your grocery store, especially during a pandemic. Like that's where a lot of that comes into play. Um, not only are there some legality stuff around certain things, but there's also the thing around, I just, I don't know what you like and let's work together to get there. I'm here to collaborate, right? We're here to collaborate as coaches and that's what we do with clients. Um, but we're not here to instruct. And if, if, if you're in a position where you need something like that, like Sue was mentioning, go seek out a dietitian or, or seek someone out that can refer you out um, to a dietitian or someone that can, is more legally uh, bound to, to help you with something that can help you with, whether it's a disease state or something like that, or, um, some larger issue in your life. So 
I just wanted to round out that. Um, those are my thoughts. Um, do you guys have any other any other things you want to mention from all the topics today? All right, we'll end it up.